As is mentioned, I will speak today on the topic of the karma confusion. Do our problems come from our present or our past karma? I will take this in three parts and if any of you have any reflections or questions after each part, you can ask them. The first part is karma is action reaction correspondence but not a one to one correspondence. The second point is that better to focus on our intention than on our situation. And last part, how our, how our spirituality, our spirituality can help us rise beyond our karma. So first point, let's begin, I'll speak this to 4.16 and 17 in the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna says, Kim karma kim karmeti kavayo pyatra mohita tatte karma pravakshami yajyatva moksha se shubhat. Karmano yapi bodhavyam bodhavyam chavi karmana, a karmanascha bodhavyam gahana karmano gati. So he says that what is action and what is inaction? It's very difficult to understand. Therefore, we need to understand it carefully. Actually, Gahana Karma Nogati Karma is actually quite difficult to understand. Gahana. So now, when you hear the word karma, what what meaning does what comes in your mind? <coughs> Sorry? Yeah, action. Anything else? Anything, anything else? Previous action. Previous actions, more specifically reactions. Yes. yes, reactions to previous actions. Isn't it? So, oh, I'm suffering some bad karma now. That means it's reactions to our past actions. Now, these are two meanings that are distinct. First is action, second is reaction. Both are called, in, both we use the word karma for it. Thirdly, we also talk about the law of karma. When we talk about the law of karma, what are we referring to at that time? We're not referring to action or reaction. We are referring to the action-reaction correlation. So the word karma can have multiple meanings. So let's focus on what we are trying to discuss here. So basically, we all live our life based on a presumption of cause-effect correlation of action-reaction connection. Mm. Say, if a relative, a, if a child comes back home and a chi your child has got a black eye, mm. if your child has got a black eye, yes, what happened? Say, nothing. I just got it by chance. What do you mean by chance? You don't get a black eye by chance. Something must have happened. Did you fight with someone? What happened? So whenever we see some effect, we presume there must be a cause. Now, similarly, whenever there is an action, whenever there is an action that we do, we understand. As a part of intelligence, there will be consequences. If a child wants to eat too many chocolates, the child may say, I will enjoy it. But the mother will say, no, not so many. The tooth will get spoiled. So, we all operate based on this implicit understanding that there is a correlation between action and reaction. Mm. That, that if some, some situation has come upon us, we want to look, okay, what caused that situation? Or if you are doing something, so in, in, uh, we also look at what is going to be the result of that in future. So basically, one aspect or a central aspect of intelligence is to look for cause-effect connection in things. And when a people are not, when a child says is very small, unintelligent, child may not see the cause-effect connection. Except like when babies are very small, they may cry and they can't even say why they are crying. And the mother can see only the effect and they wonder, they have to figure out, is there the, is the belly paining? Is there some ear pain? What is, what is that? So, when we see an effect, we try to figure out some cause. 
Now, normally we do function based on this cause effect correlation, and in some situations, in some situations, the cause effect correlation doesn't seem to make sense. Sometimes we try to figure out why, why is this happening. Say, suppose the doctor tells you that you've got flu. Then you may have to try to figure out, uh, okay, you may ask the doctor, what caused the flu? What caused the flu? Doctor may say, okay, actually, maybe there's, a, there's some germ in the air right now. But had you gone somewhere, did you meet someone who had this flu? You come in contact? We ask them. And sometimes, some diseases, it's very difficult to figure out their cause. Like say, can some cancers, why people get, it's very difficult to Now, sometimes when the cause effect connection doesn't make sense for us, at that time also what do we do? We immediately, okay, now I got this cancer, got this disease, okay, what medicine can I do? Now what do, when we ask, okay, we don't know what caused it, but now it is there, what medicine can I take? When we are asking what medicine I can take, that means we are still having faith in the cause-effect principle. Okay, I don't know what cause produced this effect, but still I know, that, okay, if I take this medicine, maybe that cause will produce the effect of controlling this cancer or curing this cancer. So we cannot function without some, without an implicit faith in the cause-effect connection. And yet, there are times when the cause-effect connection doesn't make sense. So what we are trying to understand today is, how can we make sense when the cause-effect connection doesn't make sense? So for this, the principle of karma places us in a bigger context. Bigger context means, see, every event that happens, you could, play, you could frame it in different contexts. Say, if right now I'm speaking, I'm speaking and I get a little cough. Now, it could be because there's something in the air. It could be because I've eaten, I just drunk something, I've eaten something which is affecting me. It could be that I've got a residual cup from before. It could be that there could be various different causes like that. So we try to find, we try to frame an issue in the most constructive context. Say if I get cough right now, I might take, ask for some water, I might take some anti-cough pill or something like that. But if it's happening regularly, I might consult a doctor. So whenever we experience some effect, to deal with it, we put it in the most constructive context. So, with this point, when some, some cause effect connections don't make sense. <coughs> so what the Bhagavad Gita tells us is that we need to look at it in a bigger frame. Bigger frame means, another example I could take is, say, if suddenly the power goes off. So one frame we might put it, okay, has somebody switched off the switch by any sense? Or another could be, has the bulb got spoiled? Another could be, has the power supply been cut off? Another could be, is there a national power breakdown or is there a terrorist attack who destroyed our power plants? You could escalate this to multiple levels. So similarly, the Bhagavad Gita tells us that action and reaction, cause and effect are correlated. But the correlation is not necessarily one to one. One to one correlation means action A will lead to reaction B. But it doesn't always happen like that. I suppose the three people are walking along the road and there's some water. And they're so lost in talking that they don't notice the water away. And they see and all three of them fall. And then the first person falls. But there is an overhanging branch somewhere, they catch the branch and steady themselves. They just a slip. The second person falls and just behind, there's a lot of mud and there's a little puddle. And they fall into that and their clothes get soiled. 
Nothing is hurt except their pride. <laughs> but the third, the third person falls, and just behind there is a sharp stone. There's a sharp stone, and the head falls on the stone, and they get a hemorrhage. Now you could say all three of them are inattentive, but the same action, very different reactions. So why the difference? That difference within the immediate frame, it doesn't make sense. With small retention, this should be small. If at all there's a reaction, small reaction. Sometimes small action can lead to a big reaction. So to understand this, we need to put it in a bigger frame. Say, uh, at the end of a month, three people go to a supermarket chain. And all of them buy something, some small items worth a few dollars. And when they come out, all of them have to pay the bill. And one of them is charged two dollars. Another is charged two hundred dollars. Another is charged two thousand dollars. Hey, what's going on? Now, I say, why this difference? But then you come to know that they have a credit chain in the supermarket. And this is the end of the month. So the bill that they're getting is not just for their immediate purchase, but it's for all that they have purchased throughout the month. And the first person, this is the only purchase they have made in that month, in that supermarket. The other person has purchased goods worth $200. And the third person has throughout the month purchased goods worth $2,000. So there is a cause of a correlation, but it is not one to one. This purchase alone doesn't determine the bill you are getting. At the end of the month, the bill we will be getting may be just because of this purchase or maybe because of all the purchases throughout the month. So similarly for us, when we face particular situations in life, they are not just caused by our immediate actions. Although that immediate action seems to be the cause, that is like simply the triggering cause. But beyond that, there is also another cause. Just like if somebody has a gun and they press the trigger. Now, the trigger pressing is the initiator. But if inside there are no bullets, then nothing will happen. Or if inside there are some paper bullets, then maybe just it's fun. If there is it's a stun gun, then it might just shock the person. But if it's a machine gun with real bullets, and they kill the person. So, so now the, <coughs> the pressing the trigger is definitely a cause. But it is not the only cause. So similarly for us, when we do actions, and we do a particular action, and some situation comes in our life because of that. Sometimes we just make a small mistake, and so we just speak one harsh word, and then people hold that harsh word against us for a whole lifetime. And they just, sometimes one small wrong phrase gets us into a huge amount of trouble. Have you noticed this happening sometimes? How many of you have had this experience? You know, just one small word, but big, big trouble. And, and then this happens. It was a mistake, but a small mistake. Why make it so big? Nowadays, in today's age of social media, sometimes on Twitter or on Facebook, somebody can make one comment, and if it's politically incorrect, then it can just snowball. And people can get into big, big trouble. Recently, it happened that, I think when the Indian cricket team was here in Australia, some Indian cricketers made some statements which were considered offensive. And they, just, they, were just, they thought they were joking, but they had to be ex suspended from the team for some time. And just sometimes some things get snowball. Now there are other people at other times may have made much more objectionable statements. But why this difference? So basically, the cause-effect connection is not a one-to-one -one correspondence. And it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence because sometimes the action that we do is the entire cause. 
or sometimes the action that we do is just to trigger for some previous cause reaction to come upon us. So that's why karma is gahana, is complicated. If it is simple one-to-one -one correlation, it won't be that complicated. Now we may say, actually, this just uh, why is this so bad? I make a small mistake and I get a big, big trouble because of that. Yes, it's like that, but we have to know that it's not only always negative. Sometimes you may make a big mistake and not get into much trouble because of that. I know one devotee in uh, in New York, in New Jersey, near New York, is telling me that. He wanted to, he was wanted to go somewhere early in the morning and he was so tired, he, he, he slept, he woke up, he got into, the fly, got into the car and started driving. And then, he just fell asleep while driving. And then, finally he just woke up and so he had been driving for several minutes without even noticing. And he had almost reached his destination. Sometimes if somebody might nod off for a moment and it can be catastrophic. They say on driving, you are driving, sleep kills. Kills sleep. Don't sleep while driving. But so sometimes a big mistake can also, may not give some any result, any major consequence for us. So this, this non-one-to-one -one correspondence of action-reaction, it doesn't always work negatively for us. Sometimes it works positively also. Sometimes you make some big mistake and you get away with it also. So the basic point is that there is a cause-effect correlation, but it is not a one-to-one -one correspondence. So sometimes it may be many-to-one or it may be one-to-many. Many-to-one means many past events, like say, uh, when we get a bill, <coughs> then it is a many-to-one correspondence. All the bills from the past, we are uh, getting the, we have to pay them right now. And sometimes it may be one-to-many. One-to-many means that we do one action, but it leads to many consequences. So that, that's why the correspondence is there, but it's not simply one to one. And that's what sometimes makes it very complicated to understand things. So this is the first point about karma, that karma is a cause of a connection, but it's not one to one. Any comments or questions about this? Yes, please. Okay. Yeah, good question. So, where does free will come into play in this karma, in action, reaction, causation? Yes. Once I was in, as in, New, again in New York. So one person was saying, actually, karma determines everything. We have no free will. So then I told him, okay, I don't have free will to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, no, no, please answer this question. I don't have free will. <laughs> so, we do have free will. No doubt about it. But what our karma does broadly is, uh, it, you could say that karma determines our situation. We determine our responses to the situations. It's like, if you are driving a car. So then, uh, we might get a weather forecast. It's going to be very stormy weather. So karma determines, um, by karma we mean the past karma that we have done, the reactions to that. That will determine the weather. So what will happen in our life, that is determined by our past karma, the situations that we get. Of course, it's a little more complicated because Past karma also determines the kind of car that we have for driving. That means our our body mind machine is also a product of our past karma. So some of us, you know, may have very healthy bodies. Some of us may have very sickly bodies. Some of us may have outstanding 
brains. Some of us may have outstandingly poor brains. So, <laughs> so the vehicle that we get <coughs> is also a result of past karma. But still, how we drive is up to us. Sometimes the weather will be stormy and the vehicle also may, not, may be a little rusty. And if that combination, stormy weather and rusty vehicle, then if a person drives recklessly, it can lead to disaster. But if they drive carefully, then they might even go navigate through that difficult situation safely. So we could say that past karma determines our situations, but we determine how we act in those situations. And sometimes the situations themselves may be very restrictive. So we could say past karma determines the scope over which we can act. In 9.6 Krishna Siddhartha Bhagavad Gita that just as the wind although mighty moves within the framework of the sky. So similarly we move within the framework of our past karma. So sometimes by the past karma the framework might become very restricted. Say if we decide to take up, if we have to choose this job, should I take this job or this job or this job? That time we have choices. But if we choose a particular job, then our framework becomes restricted. The kind of boss we have, the kind of colleagues we have, the kind of work pressure we have. We have to work within that. So basically, we may think that this job is like this, but the job might turn out to be something different, some different way. But that's the, the framework we get by our past career. But within that, how we act is always up to us. Okay? Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. So, if our psychological framework also comes from the past, then aren't we forced to act in particular ways? We are different from our minds. The Bhagavad Gita explains that our existence is three-dimensional. There's a body, the mind, and beyond that is the soul. So, if we understand this, we could compare this to a computer system. The, com the hardware is like the body, the software is like the mind. And we as souls are the user of the heart, user of the hardware software combined. So now, based on the kind of software uh, we have, certain kinds of actions will come up as default in the device. But that doesn't mean we have to choose that. We, see, just, sometimes if you install a software, usually they give you, after you click the install button, you want to install this. Yes, no or wait, whatever, yes or no usually. Now some softwares, the default option is no. And then you have to click to yes and then it will install. But some, uh, some uh, software, the default option is yes. And if you don't want, you have to consciously click no. And some software, not only the default option yes, but they will give you very little time. Like if you, if you don't shift from yes to no within 10 seconds, it will automatically select yes. Hmm? and it will get installed. So like that, by our past karma, our mind, mind, when certain options come up before us, some of, one of, some of those options become like default choices. Now we can change the default choice, but we have to be, be more conscientious about it. We have to be more alert about it. So if somebody is always very pessimistic, so then that person no matter whatever situation they are, they will always think negative. Some people, they can find solutions to all problems. And some people can find problems with all solutions. 
Now, now the second mentality is not always a bad thing. So because some people might be just too optimistic. I can fix this, I can fix this, I can fix this. So we also need people with a little critical mentality. You know, this is not so realistic. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? So the caution is being cautious is good. But when a person always or compulsively keeps thinking of negative itself, then that's bad. So, as I said, for some people, when an idea comes up, the default option choice is yes. Oh, it's a good idea, let's do it. For some people, the default option is no. I don't think this is going to work. So now, those people who are too optimistic, English, the word is Pollyannish. Pollyannish, you are, uh, people are unrealistically optimistic. So, now for them, all the default option is yes. They have to, okay, is this really going to work? Let me think about it. But, so they have to, <coughs> they need someone to ground them. Some people are too pessimistic. They, somebody has to uplift them, you know. Don't be so paranoid. Just move forward in life. So, I, so we do have free will. But that free will is that when the propositions come inside us, we have to be conscious enough to not just go along with the default proposition. So when we have a habit, that means that, that is the default proposition for us. And when the, we have an addiction, then that means that default proposition, default option is not only already there, but it's like very fast, it is clicked and it moves forward. So yes, if we are addicted, then we could say the free will has become significantly compromised, but is never entirely lost. Even a person who is addicted, say somebody is addicted to alcohol, then when the urge comes, they just can't say no. There's a British thinker who said, giving up smoking is the easiest thing in the world. I have done it over a hundred times. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens? They will oh, next time nothing, I'm going to give it up. But next time the default option comes, they click it immediately. So in those situations where certain attitudes are default, they may not have control when that urge comes. But still, they do have control between the urges. So when, when the urge to smoke comes, I have to smoke, I can't give it up. I have to drink. But still, it's not that the urge it comes with the same intensity 24 hours a day. It may come after 6 hours, it may come after 1 day, it may come after 3 days. What are we doing in between? We do have free will. If at that time we are gaining some knowledge, we are developing our inner strength, maybe we are practicing some spiritual practices by which we develop our own intelligence and sharpen it, then we will be better equipped to resist the urge when it comes. So we always have free will, even if our mind is, our mind is inclined in particular ways. But based on the particular inclination of the mind, the, the free will may be less or more compromised. Okay. You had a question? Okay, good question. So, like, I 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 so when some, we get into a very complicated situation because of some small mistake, we should we try to analyze why it happened and what if two people, say two spouses, one of them likes to think a lot, one of them just wants to move on. See that's a particular disposition each of us have. And it's not a matter of what is good or what is bad. We have to see what is effective. What is effective means that sometimes in our lives, when a particular complication comes up, we can try to figure out. Say, if we just uh, we speak, we, we go to a get together and we greet someone, and that person snubs us. When that person snubs us, we will actually feel annoyed, we will feel angry also. Why did they do that? Now, if we inquire 
we might even find out maybe last time i did something and that upset them so for us to think to our capacity to look back that could could there be a cause that i can find out that is helpful primarily not just to rectify the situation but also to prevent at least the recurrence of the situation so yes thinking backward to see if somehow we can make sense of things is helpful but only to a finite degree so we could say that so tomorrow i'm going to speak on this in the sunday fees class that thinking about thinking now how much you think <laughs> so simply speaking we would say that if we have a graph of time versus <coughs> problem solving capacity if we don't think about things itself then uh, we may not get any clarity we may not learn anything it is said that those who don't learn the lessons from history will have to learn it through their own experience so we want to think and see if there's something to learn for us so in that sense the more we think about a problem we may get greater and greater clarity it's like a line moves upward the graph moves up but beyond a particular point it reaches a flat we think we think but we don't get any clarity why did they do like that why did they do like that why did they do like that sometimes we keep thinking so much about other people now why and i did this why did they do that why didn't they do that you know this sometimes people are mysterious not just to others but even to themselves you need to confront them and ask hey, why did you do like that did i do like that i didn't do know also so we are just wasting our time thinking in that situation and after some time the more we think this graph goes down you know it just become we have become more and more confused so like some people say that i was confused earlier now i'm not so sure <laughs> So, you know, if we have to ask and see what is effective, is trying to trace the cause helping us gain clarity, or it is simply confusing us. So, depending on situation, sometimes we can learn by analyzing deeply, and sometimes we just have to move on, recognizing that maybe this is beyond my capacity to learn at this stage at least. So, see, don't focus on what is right or wrong. We all will have certain default options. Just see what is effective in a particular situation. So this was the first point. Okay, you have a question, please. Okay, that's a good question. Yeah. Hmm. See, uh, sometimes <clears throat> if we could understand whether my situation I'm getting is it because of some yesterday's karma or some distant karma, some recent karma or some remote karma, then by understanding that I could rectify it. <clears throat> so, is it useful to try to find out? As I said, we can try to find out to our capacity, hmm? but trying to go too much into the past can be very confusing. we the whole purpose of karma is not so much post mortem as prognosis post mortem means <coughs> say no a person has died trying to find out what is the cause maybe cut the body from the previous steps and then try to find out so karma is rarely used for specific post mortems okay i am in this situation you see the rama and the mahabharat when somebody goes through some difficulty in the bhagavad purana people will say that Must be because of some past karma. Kena api karma. I must have done some past karma because of which I am getting this situation. But very rarely do people, if ever people try to go and investigate what was the karma. It's not so much for post mortem because it's very difficult to know. Even in the case of uh, diseases, if you see, suppose. somebody if we have some fever we go to doctor and doctor says you got malaria now when we okay malaria how do i get the malaria 
What is the common cause usually? Yes, sir. Our, it's our humanity's oldest friend. <laughs> One of humanity's oldest friend. So anyway, in mosquitoes, they bite us. Now, okay, if some patient says to the doctor, please tell me which mosquito bit <laughs> And where? Now, we can go to a certain level of specificity. But we are finite beings. We cannot go beyond that to, an, to a very high level of specificity. Now, if a doctor finds that there are too many people getting malaria, then they say, okay, is there some area where there are a lot of mosquitoes? Do we need to do some cleaning of the city or whatever? We might think of, think of a generic measure. But even in our day-to-day -day life, we don't go, we don't go to an infinite level of specificity. We go to a certain level of specificity and stop over there. So trying to go too much into the past is not very helpful. To the extent we can, with our intelligence, we can, we should. But beyond that, uh, it's not very helpful. Some people try to say consult astrologers to try to find out. And astrology today is like a big business. So astrology, okay, astrology basically what it does is, it's like gives us a weather forecast. You're going to drive on this road, the weather is bad in this day. You want to go on this road, the weather is good over here. So it's like a weather forecast. But you know, even weather forecasts are not very reliable. <laughs> so, <coughs> one of my friends, is, uh, one, one of the devotees in our movement has written a book called How to Mess Your Life with Astrology. <laughs> so, we could just get the astrology. Can I have some water? <coughs> okay, let's wait. That's okay. Some people outsource the responsibility for decision making to their astrology. <laughs> what should I do in this situation? You tell me I'll do it. No, no. Ultimately, we are responsible. And we have to make the decision. Sometimes even if we know, okay, this, this weather is stormy, this road is this road is stormy weather, is there, but it's very important for me to go, I may still go over. Sometimes we may say, oh, the, 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 the road is clear. But if we drive carelessly, we may still meet with an accident. There is no bad weather, but still we meet with an accident. That's why trying to go too much into that post-mortem mode is not very helpful. We use our intelligence as much as we can, but focus on prognosis. Prognosis basically means that we understand that we are responsible for our actions. Actions will have consequences. And even if we don't see the consequences immediately, they are going to be there. It says we are reaping some consequences of action that we don't know. Similarly, the action that we are doing, we may not know the consequences that they are going to be. Sorry, we may not see the consequences coming right now, but the consequences are going to come. So therefore, we have to be careful about our actions right now. That's the broad essential principle that you can focus on in karma. So karma, karma knowledge, otherwise it can just become very... Um, we can get obsessed with the past and that's not very helpful. Okay? Yeah. So, this was the first point. I spoke that karma is action reaction correlation but not a one to one correspondence. So, the second point, I partly addressed it in the question answer but the point was that focus on your intention, not on your situation. That means that when we are in a particular particular place in our lives, say we did some small mistake but we are going to be big trouble because of that. Okay. Rather than, why, why is the situation happening to me? Okay, what is my intention right now? Is my intention to try to make things better? Or is my intention simply to feel better by pushing the responsibility to someone else? By blaming someone else? Many times, People try to find a scapegoat. Whenever the problems come, it says that success has many parents and failure is an orphan. <laughs> so, so what happens is that when we face we get particular situations, and especially when it seems to be disproportionate, we have done no mistake or we have done some small mistake, and big problems have come. At that time, 
It's very easy to become resentful. Why is this happening? Why is this happening? Why is this happening? And resentment is utterly unhelpful. Going back to the car metaphor, driving a car metaphor, you know, being resentful <coughs> is like driving a car with the brake pressed. Everything that we do is just a waste. We steer the car. If the brake is pressed, nothing moves forward. Like that sometimes, when some situation comes in our life, it's just so frustrating. We just didn't want, so unexpected. So we could say we feel it's so undeserving. I didn't do anything like this. Why is this coming in my life? So we get caught in that why. Once we get caught in that why, why, why is this happening? Why is this happening? Why is this happening? It shouldn't be happening. That can just freeze us. Yaya sopnam bhayam shokam vishadam madhavevacha na vimunchati durmedha dhritti sapartha tamasi. Krishna says when the mind becomes infected by ignorance, then the mind keeps replaying things that have already gone over. Think that is, say, to keep fighting battles that are already lost is to be lost. If something has happened already, it's over. And okay, that, that, that mistake happened or the situation came up. It's over now, we can't rewrite the past. To keep fighting battles from the past, it is just useless. Okay, let's move on. Now what can I do? So rather than worrying so much of the situation, we have to focus on our intention. Now intention means, am I trying to, am I trying to blame someone? Or am I trying to make things better? <coughs> See, this is, if we don't get this right, the difficulties, they can make us, either difficulties can make us bitter, or they can make us better. It's up to us. That's why our intent, the difficulty has come. We can't do much about it. Some people infer when the bad situations come in their life, oh, yeah, my destiny is only rotten. Everything that I do goes wrong. Nothing works in my life. Maybe I must have done a lot of bad karma in the past. Maybe my whole life is ruined. Now, one thing about karma is that nothing is permanent. The good times in our life are temporary and the bad times are also temporary. So, when we talk about karma, it's important that we use it to recognize that we can, by our actions, create a better future for ourselves. So we just focus, oh, I was doing something bad, that's why bad things are happening in my life. We think like that, we are actually not making anything positive, we are only making things negative. That's why there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge means to know that tomato is a fruit. Wisdom means to know that tomato should not be put in the fruit salad. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, theoretical knowledge is not enough. So the idea of karma, it can work in both ways. So, if I've done some, if I'm in a very bad situation, I can think, I must have done terrible karma in the past, that's why I'm suffering. And I don't know how much bad karma I've done. I don't know how much bad suffering is going to come in my life. Maybe my whole life is going to be filled with suffering. Oh, my life is ruined. My life is useless. So that is like putting, putting tomato in the fruit salad. But the whole purpose of karma is not to blame ourselves, but to take responsibility for ourselves. What do I mean by take responsibility for ourselves? It means that, okay, I'm in a bad situation right now. I must have done something in the past because of which has happened. But my actions matter. And by doing good actions right now, I can create a better future for myself. And, and understanding this is actually very simple. If we are in a very bad situation right now, No matter how bad a situation we are in, we can always make it worse. 
they were saying, who wants to make it over? <laughs> I have already a bad situation. No, that's not the point. Nobody wants to make it worse. But the point is, that if we can make it worse, that means we are not completely powerless. If we can make it worse, that means we can make it better also. So, no matter, uh, even if we are going to a very bad situation, instead of focusing on the situation, focus on the intention. Am I, am I just beating myself down, blaming myself, blaming others, blaming destiny, blaming karma? Or am I taking responsibility? If we take responsibility, we can move forward. In whatever situation we are in, we can create a better future for us. As I said earlier, karma, bad karma that might be facing some problems in our lives, that is like a, it's, it's nothing in the world is permanent, it's a phase. So we could say that difficulty that we are going through right now, it is like a dark phase in our life. But the darkness is the darkness of a tunnel, not the darkness of a dungeon. A dungeon is where we are permanently trapped with no way to escape. A tunnel is dark, but if you keep walking, keep walking, you will come over the tunnel. So similarly, so is our, if we are going through some difficulty, right now, I saw the title of this was the karma confusion, the title of this class was, so are our problems because of our, of our present actions or our past actions. So, some, as I said, sometimes the present action, the problems that will result are disproportionate or not commensurate with the actions that we have done, then we could say that there is some past karma involved over there. So, it's because of a combination of past and present karma. So, sometimes the present karma might be 1%, the past karma might be 99%. And sometimes the past karma might be 99% is a a present karma, sorry, the present karma might be 99% and the past karma might be just 1%. So the exact combination may vary. But the important thing is that we can always take responsibility for our actions. And this is where our power lies in all situations. So if we understand that the principle of karma is not for blaming ourselves or for blaming anyone. It is for taking responsibility. So focus on our intention. Okay, what can I do in this situation right now? What do I want to do? Do I just want to feel sorry for myself? Do I want to be resentful and make things worse? Or do I want to make things better? Actually, in when you hear it this way, it makes it very simple. Who wants to be resentful? But actually, taking responsibility is work. Blaming is a shortcut or playing the victim that is also a shortcut oh, You know this person betrayed me this person did like this Oh life is so bad the economy is so bad people are so bad There was a philosopher you could say philosopher <laughs> Not a philosopher he was asked do you believe in health? And they thought that he was an atheist so obviously he doesn't believe in health So he said yes So what is health? He said, hell is other people. <laughs> <laughs> so he had so many bad experiences with people, he was so suspicious about relationships that the other people are hell. So he's almost become like a misanthrope, hating all of humanity. Now, it's, it's easy to play the victim, to become resentful. But it is utterly unhelpful. So if we focus on our intention, then the principle of karma can be empowering. If we focus on our situation, the principle of karma will appear disempowering. I repeat this point. If we focus on our situation, because the situation is not in our control, the principle of karma will, up, will seem to be disempowering. Oh, I don't know what all bad karma I've done. I don't know at all how long it's going to last. How long the situation is going to go on. I don't know. So focusing on the situation the principle of karma will seem disempowering. But focusing on our intention. Okay. If, if there is an action-reaction correlation, that means right now, if I do the right action, I will get a good result in the future. Maybe immediately, maybe in the distant future, but I will get it. So if we focus on our intention, the principle of karma becomes empowering. And that's why I said, when we are going through situations, 
focus not on the situation focus on the intention okay, this was second point any questions or comments about this yeah so we um, you say you should not uh, think too much on the situation mm. my thing my question is how do we understand our mistakes to correct over it and uh, second thing is uh, i have uh, understood krishna teaches teaches by giving some difficulties so um because he's, we are like a kid for him so by making the situation be difficult for us so he will, we will um we try to focus on krishna uh, towards krishna so i try to surrender to krishna and try to find whatever our bad thing what um our mistake we have done yeah so if i don't think what mistake i have done then how do i okay good question <laughs> so if we don't consider what mistakes we have done then how do we learn learning happens at multiple levels not all learning is conscious and volitional just like say i am right now speaking english but if you ask me when exactly did i learn the english alphabet i don't remember that when did i learn english grammar i don't remember that so there is much learning that has happened at a subconscious level so when we are driving on a road if you are in india you drive on on one side if you are in america you may drive on the other side now initially it's conscious contemplation but afterwards it just subconsciously it happens so it's not necessary that every situation needs to have a consciously learned lesson some situations can have that's why i said that we have to see whether thinking is helping or not helping so sometimes we can make out okay i made this mistake and that's what led to this whole issue so let me be careful in future but sometimes it might not be any mistake on our part but some issue has come up so we have to see whether again it is effective and as far as what krishna wants to teach us again sometimes the lesson is simply that we need to raise our consciousness on spiritual level not anything specific that we have to learn about a particular course correction so we don't have to worry too much about that okay. yeah so uh, applying this principle of uh, karma inside the corporate and work can you give us an idea And if you are in a managerial position, you tend to deal with a lot of politics, and sometimes the politics can be really gross and detrimental, and it can lead to loss of a job, either yours or somebody else's as well. So in this situation, to protect your own self, you have to stand up and fight, right? Um, so that is your reaction to the situation for your own protection. Yeah. But sometimes it can lead into a feeling of guilt because. the environment itself is so hostile that you do something and then feel bad about it so how do you compute the degree of your reaction how do you actually decide what should be the degree of your reaction so that you protect yourself at the same time hmm. you don't get into the mode of guilt okay good question so sometimes in political environment we have to fight but when we fight we may feel guilty so how do we protect ourselves but not overreact so much that we start feeling guilty because of that hmm? that's what and also what is a benchmark to define that this reaction is appropriate okay and yeah how do we decide which reaction is appropriate so broadly the bhagavad gita is a realistic book it is not just an idealistic book sarva rambha hi doshena dhume nag nirbavata so it says that sahajam karma konteya sa dosham apinatya ji in 14.45 46 47 80.45 46 46 parjan krishna analyzes how we function in the world and he says that in this world whatever we do there are faults with it and it is like the example whenever we light a fire along with the fire smoke will come so sahajam karma konteya sa dosham apinatya ji So with every work there is some fault so don't just give up the work because the fault is there we see in the mahabharata the pandavas 
were subjected to so much political conspiracy against them by the Kauravas. And they had to deal with it. So if we are in a particular situation, we have to be pragmatic. Pragmatic means practically intelligent of how to move forward. Now, there could be three broad modes of functioning. We could call them as passive, aggressive and assertive. So passive means whatever anyone does, what can I do? We just, pass, we just uh, resign ourselves to our fate and do nothing about it. Now that is unhealthy. That will, we, we will, people will walk over us and eventually we will become very pessimistic, resentful, bitter. Uh, that is, that is, in the Bhagavad Gita talks about three modes of material nature, Sattva, Rajas, Tamas, goodness, passion, ignorance. So, being passive is in the mode of ignorance. Being aggressive is in the mode of passion. If you did this to me, so I will do that to you. You do this, I do that. So, uh, it's simply, we start a chain of action, reaction that just keeps multiplying. And sometimes there are vendetta wars that happen between dynasties. No, one, one, per, one, one family, the child is, some, some person is injured and then they hit back and they kill a child, kill a young man, this person and they go and kill 10 people in that family and they come and kill 100 people in this family and then they kill 1000 people in that tribe and then they blow up this whole tribe. <laughs> so it can just escalate endlessly. So being aggressive is also undesirable. But being assertive means being purpose-centered. Purpose-centered means, okay, what am I here for? I am here to get this job done. And this person is coming in the way of this job. And this person is coming in the way. Then I will have to stand up and protect my purpose. So I am, I'm, if I take a stand, I am fighting. I am not fighting primarily against them. I am fighting for the purpose which, I'm, which is important. And if for that purpose I need to fight, yes, I will fight. You see, in the Bhagavad Gita, the whole Bhagavad Gita is spoken in a sense before a Kurukshetra war. Arjuna was confused, should I fight or not fight? And Krishna tells him through the Bhagavad Gita that he should do his duty, which is fighting at that particular time. The Bhagavad Gita is not a call to war, it is a call to dutifulness. And the dutifulness, the duty at that particular exceptional situation happens to be war. But even in that situation, Krishna tells in 11.55 in the Bhagavad Gita that Arjuna, you do your work, but how do you do your work? Mat karma krun mat paramo mat bhakta sangha varjita nirvaira sarva bhuteshu yaha samameti panda. So he says, nirvaira sarva bhuteshu. Do not have any animosity towards anyone. So you can fight, but don't treat them as your enemies. You are not fighting against someone, you are fighting for dharma. Your purpose is to establish dharma. And if somebody is opposing dharma, you have to fight against them. But so don't be inimical. We may be functionally fighting against someone. But internally, we don't have to be hostile or inimical towards them. So, so being assertive means standing up for a cause. Being aggressive means getting into a personal agenda of settling scores. So we don't want to become aggressive. We don't want to become passive. We need to be assertive. And as far as understanding in a particular situation, what is the limit? Now we ourselves have to see uh, how we function the best. Uh, I mean, again, this is determined by effectiveness. <clears throat> so sometimes for some people, you just, uh, like some dog, they show their teeth and some thieves run away. The dog won't have to go and bite, but just showing the teeth is enough. Some the dog don't have to show the teeth, they have to bark. Sometimes they have to chase. Sometimes they may not have to bite. But we have to, with experience, understand what is adequate. We don't have to go excessive. But by experience, we learn what is enough. And that's how we move forward. Okay. Okay, okay yes. Ji, uh, in Gita, Krishna says to Arjun that uh, you are just limit master and I have Okay. 
So, if uh, Krishna tells Arjuna that you are simply the Nimitta, I have destroyed everything, then are people who are killing animals, are they also, the animals are being killed because of their own karma and the people are the Nimitta, but then people are the instrument, but then they are also creating their karma. So, how does all this work in our lives? That's why Gohana Karma no Gati. It's complicated. <laughs> but put it, there are some points, important points over here. See, Krishna doesn't say that I have destined everything. Not everything. What he says is that, see, Krishna determines the consequences of actions. So it's like if somebody is in a 10 story building, Krishna doesn't determine that they will jump off and they will break their bones or commit suicide. But if they jump off, then what is going to happen is determined. See, by Krishna's arrangement, <coughs> actions have consequences. Mm-hmm. But, see, so, so we may forget gravity, but gravity won't forget us. <laughs> <laughs> but, we are not forced by gravity. We choose. It's, only, it's not that gravity, if I am standing on the ground, I am standing on the 10th story, the gravity is not going to pull me down. If I come out, then I am pulled down. Say, now recently there was a, these two, two Boeing airplanes crashed and then all that, that particular brand of Boeing has been pulled down. Now suppose Boeing comes out, they are investigating, why did this plane crash? Suppose Boeing does the investigation and they say, the plane crashed because of gravity. <laughs> that is no explanation. <laughs> gravity is always there. Planes are meant to fly despite gravity. So, when Krishna is saying that I have destined, what has he destined? He is saying that the Kauravas, they have done such grievous misdeeds that they need to be penalized. And their penalty is already determined by you. Now, when, if you fight, you will get the credit of establishing dharma. But if you don't fight, their penalty will come in their own way. In, their, in some other way it will come. So if Krishna said everything is destined, then why is he even speaking the Bhagavad Gita to tell Arjuna to fight the war? Even Arjuna's fighting would be destined. But the whole Bhagavad Gita is spoken so that Arjuna can choose to act responsibly. So everything is not destined. What is this time is certain actions will have certain consequences. But uh, what actions we do is not this time. So now Krishna is telling Arjun in that context that don't think that by not fighting the war you will save their lives. Because they already done such heinous activities that they, are, they have been punished. So you are not fighting will not save them from the penalty. That is the point. But now you decide whether you want to act responsibly as a Kshatriya or you don't know that is possible. You can be an instrument or you can choose to not be my instrument. But you are not being an instrument will not stop the reactions coming to you. Now with this, so with this understanding, we look at, say, animals being slaughtered. We really, we have to focus, this is going to be my last point, which I'll come to briefly, that we, our focus has to be always not on what is other people's karma. It has to be focus on, it has to be, fo- we have to focus on what is our dharma. Not on what is other people's karma, but what is on our dharma, what is our duty. So, if we start focusing in all situations on other people's karma, we could become, we could become either monstrous or at least monstrously insensitive. What do I mean monstrously insensitive? Say if a baby is crying. If a baby is crying, should the mother think baby is crying because of past, past karma? <laughs> well, what is the mother's duty? What is the parent's duty? Take care of the baby. But sometimes, although the mother takes care of the baby, still the baby keeps crying. Maybe she has got some painful disease because of which she is crying. That time you can say, okay, something more is going on. But my duty is to try to take care of it. So, now, it could be that those animals are destined to die. <clears throat> but those who slaughter those animals, they are not thinking that I am giving the destiny to those animals. They are simply thinking, I am earning my living by this. 
So, and because they are earning, well, they are doing, cause, inflicting a lot of pain to others, they are going to get the karma for that. They are going to get the karma for that. So, if, now, is those animals uh, death destined or going to be slaughtered? We can't again really say that so clearly. Because we live in a very artificial society right now. Some people say that, oh, if you don't eat meat, then animals will overrun, overrun so the world. <laughs> It's a, it's a, it's a good attempt at an argument. <laughs> it's not even an argument because the animals that are slaughtered are not growing in the wilderness and taking over the jungles. The animals that are are slaughtered, they are they are they are cultivated like vegetables in factory farms. So they are grown to be killed, to be slaughtered. So if we human beings had not grown made the factory farms. They would not be in that condition at all. So, if we start going into what is whose karma, we can get, we can justify horrible things also. We have to focus on what is our dharma. What is my duty in the situation? And we act accordingly. Okay? So, let me just complete one last point and then we we'll, can have a few questions after that. So, as I said, our spirit, I said, the first point I spoke was that karma is not a one-to-one -one correspondence. Second point is, amid difficulties, focus not on the situations, focus on your intention. And last point is, our spirituality can raise us above our situations. Can raise us ultimately above our karmic situations. How does that happen? What does spirituality actually mean? For some people, spirituality means, oh, when I go to a place, I feel good about it. I feel very good. Okay, that, that good feeling can be a part of spirituality. The Bhagavad Gita also explains, spirituality is a level of reality. Spirituality is not just a state of mind, it is a level of reality. It is like I said, come hardware, software and user. So body, mind and soul. The soul is spiritual reality. So if we consider, say a three-story building, in that three-story building, this is the ground level. Actually, some countries are ground level, some countries are level one. What do you call over here? Ground level. Ground level, then level one, level two. Okay, in America, it's level one, level two, level three. There's no ground level. Okay. So anyway, so if you have ground level, level one, level two, the three levels are there. Now, the ground level is like physical reality. The level one is like mental reality. The level two is like spiritual reality. So suppose there is a flood and there is a storm. Now the water is rising, rising, the water is covering the ground level. We might get very agitated. Say so you come to the first level. The first level is there, but there are there is like it's a complete open air. The wind is flowing so much that actually sometimes the first level can be more chilly, more stormy than the ground level also. But the first, second level, the second level is well insulated, it's protected. So similarly for us, when we face difficulties, it's like a flood coming at the physical level. And the, the mental level is the mind, sometimes the mind gets more agitated. So we face a problem and sometimes the mind is complaining about the problem is a bigger problem than the problem itself. <laughs> Like suppose the weather becomes very hot. Now some people, right from the morning, they wake up and they just keep replaying the same track. It's so hot. It's so hot. It's so hot. It's so hot. And after you hear it 10, 15, 20 times, the heat doesn't annoy you as they're saying it is so hot. <laughs> so similarly, our mind is like that. Our mind is a complainer. It keeps complaining, this is so terrible, this is so terrible, this is so terrible. And thus it makes the problems worse. So we could say that there is a flood at the ground level and along with the flood there is a storm at the first level. So at the mind level also we are disturbed. But if we understand that spirituality is not just a state of mind, it is a level of reality. We rise to the level 2. The level 2 is completely protected. Then, although there is a flood and there is a storm, in level 2, we feel safe, we feel secure. 
So the spiritual level of reality is where we can raise our consciousness by our spiritual practices. So spirituality can refer to a state of mind. It can also refer to a level of reality. Spirituality also refers to the process by which we can rise from the ground level to the first level to the second level. So this is the, there are many processes of spirituality. The Bhagavad Gita recommends Bhakti Yoga as the most potent. Mai Sarvani Karmani. So says, you just devote your work to me and you will come to me. So Krishna lifts us up. So when the flood comes at the ground level, now if we can raise our consciousness to the th- second level, we will give safety. There will be the flood still, there will be the storm still, but we will be safe. So what our spirituality does is, it helps us gain security within by understanding that we as souls are eternal. That we as souls are parts of God. And God is ultimately in control. See, Krishna is so expert that although bad things may be happening, and even we may have made mistakes because of which bad things have happened, but Krishna can bring good even out of the bad. So when we rise to the spiritual level of consciousness, we take shelter in Krishna. We chant his holy names, we hear his kirtans, we hear his message, we hear his pastimes, we pray to him. By this our consciousness rises to the third rises to the level. And there we experience peace. We experience calm clarity. And then even if the storm goes on, we can we don't there is no storm inside us that is making things worse. Krishna will bring good things in after the bad. So we may have done many bad karma in the past, but if we take shelter of Krishna now, Krishna says, Dadami buddhi yogam tam ye namam upayanti te. This I will give you the intelligence to make good decisions. So we connect ourselves with Krishna. We, as we absorb ourselves in Krishna, the, by our past karma, the storm will be there, the flood may be there, but we stay secure. We get a secure place during that time. And then eventually the storm and the flood will subside. And then we will be able to move forward again. So for us, what Krishna, what our Krishna consciousness, our spiritual advancement does is, it raises us above the situations created by our past. And thus it gives us inner security. So I earlier talked about overthinking about the problem and making things worse. So if we have made a habit of thinking about Krishna, that is the karma that we can do right now. Thinking about Krishna is not, uh, is the activity that we can do right now. And by that, we can create an attachment to Krishna. The more we habituate ourselves to, say, meditating on him, hearing about his wisdom, then the more thinking about him will become easier and habitual and relishable. And when we create that habit, in the storm we won't panic. We will rise up. We will rise up and we will have security over there. So I'll conclude with one example. That Krishna is like the ultimate genius. See, we may have made many mistakes. Let's suppose you are driving and the GPS says turn left and we turn right. Then what does GPS do? He recalculates, he recalculates. Does the GPS say, you didn't obey me, get lost. <laughs> <laughs> the GPS never does that. The GPS immediately reroutes. So similarly for us, Krishna is like the ultimate GPS. Now we may make wrong choices, we may have made wrong choices in the past, but Krishna doesn't hold it against us. In whatever situation we are in, no matter how many wrong turns we may have taken, Right now, we can take a right turn. If we turn towards Krishna, Krishna is there to guide us. And by his guidance, we will get help in two ways. One is, we will get relief amidst problems. And then we will get release from problems. Relief amidst problems means that the storm is there, the flood is there. But if we connect with Krishna, then we rise to the second level. So that we don't feel so disturbed, that we have some calmness, we have some confidence. If the problem is there, but we get relief amidst the distress. And then eventually the storm will go. 
we will get relief from this process. And thus, turning toward Krishna and taking shelter of Him is the best foundation for us to deal with whatever difficulties we might be. That is not a substitute for practically dealing with the difficulties. But sometimes there is practically very little we can do. And whatever little we can do, our agitated mind prevents us from doing it. So if we first take shelter of Krishna, first connect ourselves with Krishna, rise to the second level, and then we look down and we deal with the situation. So sometimes uh, we just try to fix the problem first and when it doesn't fix, we turn toward Krishna. That's okay, at least we're turning toward Krishna. Right? But if we turn toward Krishna first, pray to him, take shelter of him, take get that inner security and clarity and then deal with the problem. We will be able to deal with it much better. So, whatever we may have done by our past karma, it doesn't matter. Krishna is always with us and Krishna will help us move through them. Whatever karma may get us to, Krishna will get us through. Whatever karma may get us to, Krishna will get us through. So, I'll summarize. I spoke today on this theme of uh, the karma confusion. Do our problems because of our present actions or past actions? So I talked three points. The first was that action and reaction are correlated, but it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. And I explained through various examples. Say somebody slips and falls, but different magnitudes of injury happens. So somebody is given a bill, but the bill will be two dollars, twenty dollars, two hundred dollars based on how much, or $2, $200, $2,000, based on how much they have purchased over there. So similarly, action, reaction are always correlated. Even if it does, even if we can't make sense of the correlation, I don't know why I got cancer, but still, we still believe in action, reaction. Okay, what medicine can I take? And that cause will have the effect of free of cur curbing or curing the disease. So, we always implicitly accept action, reaction, correlation, and when, we can't make sense of the action, action reaction correlation with the immediate context, then we have to put it in a bigger framework. Bigger frame of reference is the soul is eternal and the soul can be carrying some karma from a previous life also. So by this, we can, <clears throat> by understanding that no one-to-one -one correlation, we can we get, avoid getting obsessed over the situations. That brought us to the second point, that amidst difficulties, Focus not on the situation, focus on the intention. Mm -hmm. Focusing on the situation makes, may make us feel, oh, this is a terrible situation. We may start playing a victim, feel sorry for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the karma narrative, karma philosophy can also play into that. Thinking, oh, I must have a terrible karma and this is going to be my lot throughout my life. No. Whatever difficulty we are in, it is like a tunnel, not a dungeon. No karma is permanent. Therefore, if we focus on our intention, that means, do I want to just uh, blame others or blame myself or do I want to take responsibility? We, we always can choose our actions. We can't choose our situations, but we can choose our actions. So karma may determine the weather, karma may determine the car we have, but we determine how we drive. So by focusing on our intentions, and trying to take responsibility for our situations, we can create a better future no matter how dark our present is. And the third point I said is, that by our spirituality, we can rise above our karmic situations. We talk about this three level building. So by our past karma, a flood may come at the physical level, at the ground level. A storm may also come at the mental level. Sometimes that storm is more problematic than the flood also. Sometimes the the mind's complaining about a problem is a bigger problem than the problem itself. But either way, if we can rise to the spiritual level, spirituality is not just a state of mind, it is a level of reality. And there is a process for rising to that level of reality. So by the practice of Bhakti Yoga, if we rise to the level 2, that is where there is security and safety. So we can, by practicing spirituality, raise our consciousness to the spiritual level and experience core security, security within us. And especially if you practice Bhakti Yoga for rising upwards, then we also understand that Krishna is in control. And Krishna is so expert that even through our mistakes, 
you can keep acting and keep guiding us like a gps wrong turn you can still can get us back on track so by taking a shelter of krishna by directing our consciousness towards krishna and his difficulties we will first get relief amidst distress and eventually we will get the security and the clarity to deal with the issue by which we will also get release from the distress so whatever karma may get us to krishna will get us through thank you very much hare krishna Do we have time for questions? Can we speak? Okay. Any other questions? Yes, please. Yeah, let's go. Okay, so if we kill pests in our home, such as spiders or cockroaches, do we get karma? So there is the principle of jivo jivas jivana, the what Darwin talked about. And this is the world is a brutal place. It's like a jungle where survival of the fittest is there. So one living being is often the prey for another living being. So in some ways, killing is unavoidable. I was at a medical conference recently where they asked me to speak about karma in the world of medicine. So I was telling that so when if you want to think of it in that way, you know, a doctor who gives antibiotics to a patient, a doctor is like a cold-blooded murderer. Because <laughs> we are planning systematically to kill all the germs in the body. So it's a good <laughs> But then what do you do? If you don't kill those germs, the germs will kill you. So we we can't be paranoid. We have to focus not so, so much on dreading. Oh, I don't want to do bad karma. I don't want to do bad karma. We have to focus on doing our dharma. So doctor's dharma is to save the patient's life. And certainly wherever killing is avoidable, we should always avoid it. But in some situations, it is just unavoidable. Now, with respect to pests, it depends on how many and how troublesome they are. It's best if we could prevent it. Say, if we keep the house clean, and if by that we can avoid the pest. That's the best. But if we can't, and the pests are troubling us, they're multiplying. Then what can you do? It's will we get karma for it? Yes, we will. But then every single action has its own karma associated with it. When walking on the road, we might step on some ants. So we can't just uh, keep fearing and dreading and trying to avoid bad karma. Our, the focus should be on trying to do our dharma. And as, so, if we try to do bhakti, then that can also raise the law karma. So it's best if you can prevent and avoid it. But sometimes it's just not possible. As I said, the world is a place which is filled with problems, with faults. So all endeavors are covered with faults. So we just sometimes have to do the needful. But prevention is always better than. Then elimination. Yes, yes, please. So how does it explain the group karma? So for instance, you mentioned about the two aircrafts. The group of people are dying or something. Or that, for instance, is it a karma that we are all doing? How does it apply to it? Hmm. So, is there something called group karma? Say, a whole plane crashes and all the people in that plane die. Or say now all of us are here together. Is this because of some group karma? There is the understanding that there are multiple. All of us have done multiple levels of karma. That means that see if we consider a, kar- a karma water tank, like a karma like a water tank. So there is some water we have already stored in it. There is some water that is going in, and some water that is coming out. So now all of us have a karma tank in which there is there is some reservoir of good karma, some reservoir of bad karma, some stock of good and bad karma is there. 
Now, how this good and bad karma comes upon different people at different times, that is karmana daivane, that is broadly determined by destiny. So, if say people die together in a in some mass casualty, like a or a mass disaster, like a airplane crash, it doesn't necessarily mean that all of them have done the same identical karma because of which all of them are getting that situation. We have to understand that they may all have done different karmas, but karma is like a stockpile. So that part of the stockpile of karma gets ex exhausted when, by what is proportionate to their particular loss of this body that they have. The soul is eternal, but the soul, when we die, the soul just gets separated from this body. So yes, there is a principle of mass karma, but mass karma doesn't mean that everybody who is in that situation has done the same karma. We all have done different quantities of, we all have done various karmas and that stockpile from that sometimes at one moment a large withdrawal may happen by which a large number of people might suffer. Now having said this, we have to also understand that there is an immediate cause and we are going to address the immediate cause. So if there is a technical flaw in the flight, then the, it's not that we can say it's because of their past karma. We have to address issues at this level as much as possible. And if they are not addressable at this level, then we can understand that maybe there is something from the past. So, yes, people who uh, suffer because in a, in a mass disaster, yes, there is something called mass karma. Now, say all of us who have come here, is it because of mass karma? Yeah, at one level, the the opportunity to practice spirituality that is not necessarily coming because of past karma that comes because of krupa so there is whenever we want to grow spiritually there are two things there is there is fortune and there is intelligence so to get the opportunity to practice spirituality that is a matter of fortune to take the opportunity is intelligence so now our past karma can make us inclined towards spirituality or our past karma may make us disinclined towards spirituality but our past karma doesn't determine whether we become spiritual or not it's up to our it's our choice and the, we have to get the opportunity that's mercy so i wouldn't say our coming here necessarily is mass karma because it's it's we are coming to krishna's okay thank you yeah, any other questions yes please So, if we work in a particular place where other people may be eating meat or we may have to serve meat if we are in a supermarket or a hotel or something like that. So, what do we do at that time? See, it's more important to be Krishna conscious than to be karma conscious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, a pa one part of being Krishna conscious is also to be karma conscious. Because karma is also the principle that has been given by Krishna. But if we become too conscious of karma, we can we can become very insensitive. If we are dealing with people, if somebody is eating meat, then we can't be discourteous to them. We have to be polite to them. So if we are, if it happen to be in a job where, say, meat is being served and we are serve, we have to sell it or serve it or whatever. Okay, if, if we can, uh, if we can avoid and change that job, that's that's good. But if we can't, if there is karmic implication that comes when we work in particular situations. But the karmic implication also depends on how directly we are involved in it. If somebody is eating meat, they are involved in it. Somebody is killing the animal, they are also involved in it. Now, sometimes, now somebody is directly killing, they can see the animal suffering and dying. So that, that is certainly much more serious karma. 
some people just in the culture they just grew up eating meat they don't even know where meat comes from they don't even know that animal is slaughtered so they they are also getting some karma but they are not conscious of it and how much we are conscious of also determines how we are accountable we are for some things uh, so there are different degrees of implication depending on how much how we are associated with something now, if we could avoid getting getting involved in those things that's good but if we can't then we try to make sure that at least we keep ourselves pure and uh, we practice our bhakti seriously so generally jobs that involve direct kick violence direct killing of animals at least that devotees should not do but by like a extended chain of connections uh, we can be every one of us can be implicated because we are all living in a contaminated environment so we focus more on being krishna conscious Hey, suppose somebody has a job like that, and they say, "No, this, this is a this is a terrible job. I won't take this job." And say, "This job is reasonable. They're earning good amount. They don't have to work too much, and they take some jobs is very far away, uh, and they have to travel a lot, and it's very stressful. And then they can't practice bhakti at all. Then they will be avoiding the karma, but they are going away from Krishna. So it's more important to be Krishna conscious than to be karma conscious." and you don't have to be paranoid see karma is not like a mysterious contagious disease that is about to pounce on us <laughs> karma is logical it is not diabolical karma is logical not diabolical so if we are working with the best of our intentions doing what we can responsibly trying as much as possible to avoid bad karmic activities then karma is not going to be diabol- diabolically victimizing us Yes. Bro, the time of birth of a child has a birth chart and some influences. So, is it some karmic influences of stars? Because nowadays we see what due to modern technology of cesarean, people decide the birth of their child in a particular manner so that it is not karmic and so on. So, how does that karmic reactions still come in, and how does it affect the stars and everything? Okay. So, in say, in the in karmic influence of the stars is determined by uh, by what moment we are born. So, if we can we can control and predict that moment, and people change that moment so that they can avoid bad influences, then how is karma playing out over there? Okay. So, first let's understand what do we mean by the influence of the stars. See, the stars. Mm, astrology is a complicated subject. I don't want to go into it in details. But broadly speaking, what the Dharmic texts explain is that we live live in a multi-level cosmos that is interconnected, deeply interconnected. So now the kinds of interconnections may be so subtle that we may not understand. Say so like a doctor may see a person and they may see that okay, oh. Oh, you are anemic. We might just see the person and say that oh, you, your your nails are white. So the doctor sees more the same thing, but they see more because they have more knowledge. So they can see we can see this color of the color of the nails or color of the skin, but they can see much more because they have knowledge. So they can see a connection over there. So like that, knowledge enables us to see connections. So now it is when we say that person is mangalic or whatever, uh, that doesn't mean. that that's that particular celestial object is the cause of suffering rather it is our own past karma that is coming to us and the broad pattern of how the karma is going to come to us that is indicated by the position of certain celestial objects so now if we adjust our birth so that the celestial objects are in a are not in an unfavorable position now what we are, we are not changing our karma all that we are doing is we are we may be changing the way the karma will manifest in our life because we have free will right now so by our free will we can change certain things and as through technology we get more control we might be able to control certain things more than what we were able to control in the past but it's not that somebody we cannot trick karma 
So it's like, you know, you come at, you are born one minute later, oh, ma oh, you know, Mars is going to ruin your life. <laughs> and you use technology to be born, be one, to be born one minute earlier, and now you escape all your time. We can't do like that. But the, so, so, it's more of a readjustment of how karma might manifest in our lives. It doesn't change uh, the karma itself. So, one last question. Let's stop here. Okay, yes. Then anyone who has not asked a question wants to ask? Yes, please. Uh, you said that the result of karma is predestined and uh, no one can change it. But if somebody is practicing Krishna consciousness even in the primary stages, Krishna is trying to help that person. So does he alter the result of karma makes it less intense or and gives that person more tolerance to get through that karma? Okay, good question. So if you practice Krishna Bhakti, does, how does exactly does it alter our karma? Okay. See, at the first level, Bhakti Nath Thakur is a prominent Acharya in our tradition. And he explains that there is Prarabdha Karma. Prarabdha Karma is the karma that we are already going through. Like I said, karma will determine our car and karma will determine our weather. But we determine how we drive. So we could say the particular body that we have, that is determined by our karma. So, some people may have a very attractive face and some people may not have a very attractive face. Now, just because somebody becomes a devotee, their face is not going to change. Whatever body that we have, that is the installment of, that is, that is one installment of karma which can't change. But, you know, our face may not change, but the expression on our face can change. We can be resentful, we practice bhakti, we become cheap. Sometimes even a very attractive person, if they are resentful, they don't look very attractive. And sometimes a person who is not so attractive also. If they are cheerful, that itself brings attractiveness to it. So, so the, the prarabdha karma, in terms of the kind of body that we have, that itself can't be changed. But there are also layers that the mind can be changed significantly. And uh, how does Krishna help us? You could say that Krishna helps us in multi multiple ways. One is, first of all, Krishna gives us the knowledge just to, to, to Bhagavad Gita, that what kind of karma will have, what kind of consequences. By that, we will not do further bad things. Not only that, Krishna gives us purification through bhakti, through the higher taste. Sometimes we know this is bad, but we can't give it up. But if we practice bhakti, then we get the higher taste. So at least we don't create further bad karma. That is itself a big help. And as far as the past karmic reactions that are coming to us, Krishna can help in both ways. One is, as I said, he gives relief amidst problems. The problem comes, but Krishna gives us the strength to resist it. Krishna raises us above. It's like, say, if, if a person is even like mother, or if a teacher is beating a child, you're not on your homework, a stick is being beaten. The stick comes and hits, but the child is wearing a thick glove. Then, the child, so say the mother knows that the teacher is strict and the child has not done the homework, so the, teacher, the, child is, the child is going to be beaten with a stick in the hand. Nowadays, of course, teachers don't beat like that, but <coughs> consider the hypothetical situation. So, uh, now the mother doesn't want the child to be punished. But at the same time, the child, mother doesn't want the child to be responsible also. So when the child is going to the school, the mother puts a nice thick glow on the child's hands. And the child goes with the glow, the teacher says, teacher says, you're not done your homework? No. Okay. Come here, show your hand. The, sna the stick hits. There's a lot of noise, but the stick doesn't hurt. The stick hits, but it doesn't hurt. So for us as devotees, that glow is the remembrance of Krishna, is Krishna Consciousness. If we have Krishna Consciousness, the blows of life will hit, but they won't hurt that much. Okay, of course, sometimes the child while going along school, why do I need to have this glow? Just takes it up. <laughs> <laughs> then the child will be beaten. <laughs> and the child will hurt. So sometimes we have Krishna Consciousness, what 
the use? Let's check. So many things I have to do. I don't want to do this. We just give it up. Then karma will hit us. But if we take shelter of Krishna, even if the karmic situations come, we will get the inner, we will get the strength so that they won't hurt us that much. And of course, Krishna can in some situations just release us from problems also. Okay. Thank you very much. Shri Prabhupad ki, Shri Mad Bhagavad Gita ki, Tai Gaur Prema. Is Gaya Shatrachar Prabhu ki? Jai.